we got the report that uh, obviously it happened overnight, um, what were the conditions like? It was a it, it was a beautiful night. Uh, we, we had uh, ten knots true, uh, seventeen knots apparent. Uh, we were close reaching uh, right up the rum line. Uh, the wind had been down earlier in the night, um, and we were motoring, uh, which is part of this race. Uh, we'd um, uh, set sail about um, uh, 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 two thirty. Uh, the watch. There was one watch that was on to four, uh, and then my watch came up at four. Um, so I'd gone back to bed at, uh, at three after we got, to, got rolling along. Um, and um, the, um, so I came up at four, uh, and uh, at about 4.15, I went forward, um, and uh, for some reason I, I went to look in the head, um, and there was, um, the head was full of water, uh, right up to the threshold of the, of the, of the, uh, of the compartment. Uh, now, when you're on starboard tack, you have to close the, um, the sink uh, because the water will percolate back. Um, and I thought, well, maybe the head had been, uh, the valve on the, the, the toilet had just overflowed, the, the fill valve, and that happens sometimes, and, uh, and I didn't think much of it. But I, uh, there was, but I was very concerned by the volume of water. There was a lot of water. Um, so I called to James Watlington, who was, uh, it was uh, my, along, on my watch with me, asked him to stand the boat up. I um, pushed the boat into the wind so the boat stands straight up so that I could open the cock and, uh, and pump the water out. I did that, and there was a lot of, uh, of uh, gurgling and the, and the rest. We got the water out quick enough. Uh, and then um, uh, I told James, okay, we're all set. Uh, then I went back to the, uh, the galley of the boat. Well, the boat, a, it's a, a center cockpit boat, so the salon is higher than the forward section, it's higher than the galley. Um, so the galley floor is sort of the same height as the floor forward. Uh, when I went into the galley, there was water in the, uh, in the, uh, the corner of, the, bo of the, the galley. Remember, the boat's like this, uh, so there's water in the corner of the galley. So I opened the engine and found that there was about a foot and a half of water in the corner of the, of the engine room. Uh, so I went in and quickly closed the shuttle, the seacocks in the engine room. Uh, I'd already closed the seacock up forward um, and um, called out uh, to people that we were, we've got a problem here. Um, closed the other seacocks. Uh, we have a, a table with all the seacocks on. Um, and um, uh, then tried to find where, where the problem was. In the meantime, we knew that we had very luckily, you know, we're in a race and we've got other boats in the race uh, and we're using um, yellow brick and we're using, you can see boats on AIS, and we had Esprit de Corps, uh, a Volvo uh, 50, uh, 60 I should say, uh, from Montreal, out of Montreal, uh, and we knew he was about four or five miles behind us. Um, so we tried to, I, I got one of the crew members to try to raise him on the radio. Um, we'd had some problems with the radio before the start, we changed the antenna. And, and so I had him basically using a VHF, a handheld VHF, um, and, uh, and we couldn't raise him. Um, and I think that was a problem of our VHF. Um, but uh, at first, uh, the crew member Tatum uh, was calling out, uh, and then we thought, well, we've got to, we've got to, it, it, it's important, we've got to, we've got to get att his attention because he was key to making sure it was a safe situation. Um, so James Watlington, um, or excuse me, um, um, Jock McRae from uh, Oakville, uh, who sailed with me a lot, uh, um, he, got, he got started on the flares, started a red flare, then set on a parachute flare, and the parachute flare uh, certainly caught their attention, um, and um, so we could start to see them coming towards us, and then eventually we got on in radio contact with them. So now we knew we had a, 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 a safety situation. Uh, in the meantime, some of the other crew members uh, were getting the life raft ready, um, and um, uh, meanwhile we're trying to figure out where where the where, where the, the problems coming from. Um, so then we launched the life raft, and life raft, of course, had to launch upside down. So we. A couple of us had to get on the stern and, and muscle it around. Typically, you can get in the water and flip a life raft over, but um, it's a lot better if you can do it without... Once you get somebody in the water, it's, you're, you're asking for trouble. Um, so anyway, we got that flipped over, and so now we had the life raft. 
Uh, I went back to check on the, the uh, to, to see if, if, if I could identify any, you know, if, if basically to try to find out more about where the water was coming from. Um, and uh, by that time there was, there was three or four feet in the bow of the boat. The boat was bow down. Um, and um, I sort of quickly realized, well, there's, there's not a lot I can do. Um, you know, I, um, and I was very concerned about getting trapped in the boat. You know, if the boat started going down, um, uh, you, know, you know, I just, I didn't know whether, uh, how much buoyancy, whether the boat, uh, how quickly the boat would go down. But I did know that the water was coming in really quickly. And the water seemed to me to be coming in more quickly than just a broken hose. Um, the, um, so, uh, after assessing the situation, I, I basically said, well, uh, let's, let's get in the life raft and, and go over. And um, so we, uh, we got everybody in the life raft uh, and then uh, Esprit de Corps came up. Um, and it, it's very bouncy, uh, even though it's, you know, it, there are lovely conditions of sailing, there's still, there was a good chop and, uh, and you're knocking around. Uh, but the water's warm and uh, I mean, if you had to bail in any situation, it's, it's sort of a, not a bad situation. Uh, Esprit de Corps came over and, and we t took us all aboard. And then you're watching the boat, and um, uh, and the boat's getting lower and lower. Um, and um, uh, eventually, um, uh, so basically at uh, at 4:15 we saw the water. Uh, at 4:30 I noticed I saw the water in the galley. Um, at uh, 4:45 we established radio contact with the Spree de Cor, um, and um, basically at five o'clock we were abandoning ship. And um, uh, we, it, it took the better part of half an hour to get uh, people off our boat into the life raft uh, over to uh, Esprit. Um, and on balance, uneventful, but, um, uh, but it, 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 it's, it's bouncing around. Um, and 5.30, we were aboard Esprit. Um, and we sort of, we stood watching, and, we, and it, you know it's sad. You know I've, I had this boat for 14 years, and um, we've done 40,000 miles on this boat, um, and um, you know you, you just you wonder what uh, what else you, you can do. But we couldn't, we we just couldn't identify where the water was coming from. And then later in the day, uh, when we're sort of reviewing it, and as, you know you're talking to this crew member and that crew member. The crew, the crew that were on the watch before us said, well, a half an hour before that, there was a sharp bang, uh, a cracking bang that they heard. Um, and, um, uh, and we don't, you know, we don't know, we, we, just, we, we just don't know where the water was coming from. Um, the, um, the, you know, the, the first sighting of the water was forward in the, in the head. Uh, and, um, um, and, you know, the, the boat's full of, the boat filled up very quickly. So how far is the step up from the forward part to the salon? Uh, it's two steps, it's about um, two feet. So it's pretty silent, so if the bow had a leak in it, that's the place it was going to fill up first. I, I, th I think so. I mean, but at the same time, it, you know, the water's going to percolate from front, from fore to aft, um, underneath the floorboards, but, um, but there, are, there are bulkheads. Uh, and yeah, they're weep holes, they're, and the, but the you know water's not going to get through the weep holes that quickly. Um, and um, and by the time we left the boat, the bow was 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 uh, the, the, this, we have some pictures of it. The bow was was right down. Um, by seven o'clock, the bow was awash, um, and um, and uh, well, actually before that, it was awash. But by seven o'clock, we basically decided, well, the bow's awash. There's nothing we're do, we're going to do here. We're not going to get back aboard. Um, so we we um, we started off, and the boat was obviously afloat because it showed it to, on the 7:30 um, yellow brick report. It showed, uh, but that was the last report. So I presume I've got to presume it went down. And I and I, you know, I, I've been talking with, um, with the 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 crew on a spree, just fabulous guys, really um, um, enthusiastic, lovely people. And uh, we're talking, we're sort of going through well, this scenario and that scenario and um, about how the boat would go down and um, uh, whether the boat would just sort of rest on the surface for a while um, and, uh, and then 
take time to go down or whether it would just dive down. And I guess I couldn't come to a conclusion on it, but, um, you know, you've got a big lead keel um, and um, um, you've got some, some flotation, some soft items that are going to provide some flotation, but I, you know, I, I just, I, I, I don't know whether, how do you feel about it, Talbot? Would the boat go well, down? Maybe, or? maybe there's some air pockets too. Yeah, but the maybe way, the deck. yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, and I thought, it, well, maybe air would get travel, trapped in the lazarette, but the lazarette um, hatches would, would not have been dogged down, so they'd just blow right out. Anyway. I just see a little bit from something you've had for 14 years. What goes through your mind? Oh, my God. We've, we, we sailed, we left this boat. <laughs> This was, I mean, this is this is a program that I've been on since um, since Christmas a year and a half ago. Um, we uh, we had this discussion uh, with uh, sp uh, with America, uh, and we created this um, uh, Antigua Bermuda race based on the idea of America racing spirit to Bermuda. Wouldn't that be fun? Uh, and I thought, well, uh, yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, and and I, I mean, I, I was basically in, involved from Spirit's point of view. Uh, and then I thought, well, well, actually, you know, maybe I could bring my own boat over and, and join it. And my boat was in Greece at the time. Uh, so back in, um, uh, in July, we left Greece, uh, took the boat to uh, Malta. In September, we took the boat from Malta to uh, Las Palmas. Uh, in uh, November, we joined the Ark from Las Palmas to um, St. Lucia. Uh, brought the boat up to Antigua, uh, and we're doing this race. And um, you know, we've this is and this was and then my, you know, you've, I've got my kids coming for the America's Cup. We had we have friends coming. Uh, this was going to be our chance to bring the boat back to Bermuda because we bought the boat in 2003. The boat's not been in Bermuda since 2004, and uh, we so we were coming back, and we were going to have a, a great time with the boat in Bermuda for the America's Cup. And then the boat was going to go up to, um, with my son to uh, Connecticut, was going to do the Newport Bermuda race next year, and then we were going to take it back uh, across the Atlantic uh, to the Azores um, and, uh, um, and get ready for a, uh, a CCA cruise in Sweden in 2019. Um, anyway, that's all history. And, and you know, you, you spend a lot of time with a boat and you, you, you and we, we had this thing so tweaked out and um, we just, uh, while we were in um, Antigua, uh, played around with the bowsprit and, uh, and developed a, uh, a proper strut for the bowsprit which holds the code zero and we uh, rejiggered the code zero so the code zero was uh, on this uh, torsion um, uh, uh, furler uh, in a sleeve, and it, it was, I mean, it was just great. We had, and everything was, was working like a charm, and now it's all history. What was that, that conversation like, the first conversation with your family after? You oh, just, just, you're just, just sad, you know, you're just, what do you say? You know, you just, I mean, the important thing is everybody's safe. Um, there's been a lot of, you know, we, we modeled this race after the new Porpermina race in terms of safety uh, equipment, in terms of you know, we've had a lot of experience in, in organizing races like this. Um, and the safety requirements are, are similar to the Newport Bermuda race, but not, we didn't have the, the ground force that the Newport Bermuda race has to, to do the safety checks and, uh, and the rest. But this, the, the safety equipment everybody had on board was the same as the Newport Bermuda race. So everybody had e perbs, everybody had life rafts, everybody had, uh, was broadcasting on AIS. We had yellow brick transponders, so everybody knew where everybody else was. Um, and, you know, you're, you're sailing in a race. Um, we had a, a, a caveat in the race that allowed motoring because we knew that, there's, that it's an up and down wind situation. Uh, but, it's, it, but you're all together, so you know that there are other people around, and you can see them on Yellow Brick. You can see them on, um, on AIS. Um, and, you know, we're lucky they were there. I mean, after this, you know, after this race, I'd planned to sail up to Newport, at the start of, uh, or the end of June, start of July. Uh, and we'd be doing that alone. And if we were, if the same thing happened um, at four o'clock in the morning on the way up there, uh, we could be sitting in a life raft for, for 12 hours, you know? Um, and um, anyway, it's, everyone's, you know, everyone's 
safe. The crew's all at, uh, at home, uh, probably having a dark and stormy right now. And, um, and it, um, but, you know, I, I don't have a boat. <laughs> That's been part of our family for, 15, for 14 years, you know. Can I just add, you know, Les has said that an awful lot, it's a good moment for bringing uh, Commodore Latrice Oatley, Commodore of the uh, Royal New Yacht Club. It's difficult for Les to talk about himself. To talk about uh, the, the experience and the, the man sitting next to you. Um, well, I've known Les for many years. Um, he was Commodore when I joined the club, and um, I've always been a member, sailing member here. He sailed with me in Etchells. He sailed with me in many other um, instances here. He's been an avid sailor for many years, and many, many hours and miles on the ocean is what he has put through. I mean, we know that we've been to every Newport um, meeting. We talk about safety at sea. We've, we've been through many, many iterations of what do you do? And it sounds like these guys, you know, they knew exactly the safety protocol. They had all of their documents in order. They had their um, maps on the boat. Everybody knew where everything was. Uh, what an excellent way to, you know, make sure that there's safety. And, you know, we, we in Bermuda, we know we're in an island of devils here, and we know that we're in the Bermuda Triangle, but it's wonderful that our safety at sea is most important, and we at the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club will have a safety at sea, and we will look forward to Les bringing this own personal experience to the safety at sea in Bermuda this year. You know, you, it's interesting because you sort of, you, you make notes to yourself about what you should be doing, and... Um, you know, obviously, uh, we would have done better if we'd uh, had a drill uh, before the start on um, um, abandoned ship procedure, on uh, taking water procedure. Uh, and, you know, it, we didn't have to do it before the start. We could have done it uh, at a quiet time afterwards, you know, just uh, go through, run through where all the seacocks are um, and, um, uh, and, and what everyone's going to do. And um, you said you had a, a chart, yeah. Like a so you have a, a plan of the interior. Yeah, plan. but I, I have to tell you, tell what I had a, a chart. Uh, it's a plan of the interior, and it shows where all the ports are, and uh, and significantly. And our boat has a lot of um, ports. Um, it also has a lot of ports that are above the waterline. Uh, and they're all marked, and they, the ones that are below the water line I've marked, I've highlighted. Um, but even then, you know, I'm looking at something, and I know now I should have had a bigger list uh, of, um, w w if the number was 10, 10, I should have, uh, rather than just have this chart, I should have had a list of the 10 ports, uh, and um, so that we could have had a uh, uh, you, you tick off one, you know, each of the ten uh, to make sure that you, had, you didn't miss one um, because it was just a map and um, and that's, you know, it's lots of things you think about after the fact. Anyway. Any more questions? Yeah, I mean, so it's obvious, sorry, it's Jonathan Mel from the Gazette. Um, right. I'm a land lover and it's completely hypothetical, but any idea if, if there was a slow crack, obviously she began to down water, what, what that might have been? I I, 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 I I don't really know. I mean, we, we um, I had a rigging situation a few years ago uh, where um, I arrived um, back at the boat and uh, the rig had been tightened uh, to the extent that uh, we had to take four inches out of the back stay. Uh, and um, uh, and I, 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 I listened to what he, the theory was and then uh, uh, talked to other people after the fact and, e and eased it off. Uh, but, you know, this boat's got, it's, it's a Kevlar uh, GRP boat. Uh, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a really strong boat. Um, and um, even if you push the mass down, you know, it's hard to imagine that it, that, that would have created an issue. I, I, I just, I have no idea what it was. Uh, it didn't feel like we hit something, you know. Um, um, the, the guys would have noticed that. I mean, the guys, when we came on watch, there was no, no particular notice of the of this this noise. It was just, you know, after the fact, we started talking about it. Um, and because we were trying to figure out, well, why would the boat fill so quickly? And, you know, if you have a one-inch hose, 
um, filling the boat, I don't think the boat would, I mean, it's a big boat, it's a big volume boat. The boat's um, 16 feet wide um, and it's a flat bottom. Um, it's a, there's four cabins, it's a, there's a lot of volume in that boat. Um, anyway, that's where we stand. Can you imagine trying to fill a swimming pool with a hose pipe one inch wide? I can't even wrap my head around well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's un, you know, it's, there's some water pressure, but yeah. Any other thoughts? Tell me. With other vessels there, I mean, safety wasn't. Oh, you know, we we were this this was I mean it was it was a you couldn't have asked for a better situation. We had Esprit de Corps, three or four miles or four or five miles behind us. We had Spirit of Bermuda um, uh, about five miles behind them. Uh, all three boats. Uh, we started with a a a a call to the boat that we knew that was there uh, and then when we when we realized we weren't getting when we weren't getting a response uh, and we think it was our fault not their fault um, we, um, uh, we we added Mayday to the um, <laughs> to the announcement and uh, when we added Mayday to the announcement um, um, uh, Spirit was on the case and um, hey, you also sent out a message uh, actually, we didn't. Uh, I, I, I used my um, my sat phone. Um, I, I, the Yellow Brick messaging service was fabulous in this race. We used it a lot, um, and it's a marvelous um, addition uh, and very easy to use. Much easier to use than um, than sat phone. Uh, but no, we. I, I wanted I I wanted to talk to Harbor Radio or RCC Bermuda. Um, let them be sure that they knew where we were. Uh, we'd already prepped Harbor Radio. Uh, Harbor Radio, uh, we they knew who was in the race. They knew all the satellite numbers. So when I called him, he knew what my satellite phone number was because it was on the spreadsheet that we'd given him. Um, and he knew what EDC's, as um, Esprit de Corps is known, uh, um, satellite number was. So, you know, um, they, they were right in the loop. And uh, they hooked the uh, U.S. Coast Guard in um, because we, I was concerned about the life raft. Uh, you know, we uh, we got off the life raft onto EDC. Um, I was, I thought we should be uh, piercing the life raft so the life raft wasn't floating around. Um, and uh, but the the fellow at the, at the U.S. Coast Guard um, didn't seem overly concerned about it. He he, he said, "Well, is the life raft marked? Uh, is the life raft?" Uh, and asked for a description of the life raft. Um, so the life raft's still out there. I think it's important to stress that, that, that basically your, yourselves and uh, other boats handled the situation. Although the U.S. Coast Guard was informed, um, they didn't have to deploy their resources. Oh no, no, and 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 the short answer: there are no resources out there. You know that's an issue in this race. You know you're racing from Antigua. To Bermuda, you're racing the left, the right side of the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, you're never closer than um, when you leave Antigua. Um, you're a thousand miles from Bermuda. You're a thousand miles from Miami. Uh, halfway through the race, uh, as you get towards Bermuda, you get you get a little closer. You're only 650 miles from <laughs> from uh, Hatteras. So you're you know you're out there. There's no there are no resources out there, and the resor so the resources are the other people in the race. And there was a very skilled group of sailors in this race. I mean, it was it was incredible that some of the boats we got in this race. Um, and um, I have to say, Louis was uh, was quite responsible for bringing a lot of those people in. Tell us also, Les, that uh, the involvement that uh, the Spirit of Bermuda had in in, uh, in the incident. Well, Spirit was standing by. Uh, and Spirit offered, offered to take us aboard off um, EDC, um, but um, we were very happy with the the, the, the folk on EDC, and uh, and they're just a great bunch of guys. And um, uh, Gilles Barbeau and uh, Maxime, fabulous guys. And they run this this um, uh, um, uh, sort of work challenge experience program out of Montreal, where they they um, get uh, employees. To experience a common event, uh, and they do sailing events and um, uh, mountaineering events and biking events, and they're really enthusiastic guys and really and great guys, great people to be with. I was very impressed by the crew. Yeah.
Did they let you drive? You bet they did. <laughs> they let me drive. I was watch captain for four hours last night <laughs> and uh, in about um, you know, five knots of breeze. And uh, But the boat, it's a... It's a boat handles like a dinghy. I mean, it's it's a fifty, it's a sixty foot dinghy, um, wet. Uh, you don't want to be on the foredeck on that boat. It's just uh, it's it's like it's a dinghy and um, lots of sails to play with and um, it's fun. We're glad you're safe. Well, fun. Any more questions? I would just like to say thank you to the organizer of the race, Les Crane. It's a wonderful race, and Louie and Trish, they've done a wonderful job, and nice to have you back. Well, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Just wish I had a boat. Yeah.